In the name of Jesus, my fellow blessed believers, blessed to live in the United States of America. You've heard people say to veterans and soldiers on active duty, thank you for your service. You probably even said, them, said that to them yourselves. And serving one's country, whether in the military or in some other form of government service, is a noble purpose, a gift from God, and a blessing to others. While I don't want to take away from those who served or are serving in the military, but there is that fact that as Christians, as soldiers of the cross of Christ, you and I are also on active duty. As we meditate upon our sermon text, may the example the Holy Spirit affords us in this biblical account motivate us to be faithful in our service when we are on active duty, and as Christians, we're always on active duty, so that you and I can say to each other, thank you for your service. You recall those Sunday school accounts of Daniel in the lion's den and the three men from the fiery furnace, don't you? Well, here's how they got there. Here's their backstory. Our sermon text is taken from the Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 1. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names, to Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them. And he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, so they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. This is God's word. The year is 605 B.C., 19 years before the fall of Jerusalem in 586. The kingdom of Babylon, which is located in present-day Iran, is well on its way to becoming a world-dominating empire. And at this time, it has its sights set on the wealth of Egypt, but first has to go through Jerusalem in order to get it. Under King Nebuchadnezzar's first military campaign against God's people, Babylon had turned the nation of Judah into a, uh, into a satellite state, a, a puppet regime, much like East Germany was to the former Soviet Union. 
King Jehoiakim was still on the throne, but was answerable to Nebuchadnezzar. And the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, thought it would be good at this time not only to take the best and costliest of the religious articles from Solomon's temple and take them back to Babylon for use in his own temple, but he also thought it would be a good idea to take the best and brightest of the young Jewish males, those young men from the nation of Judah, and take them back with him to Babylon and train them in career service in government to serve the empire. Among these fine, upstanding youths were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Once in Babylon, they receive an all-expense-paid three-year apprenticeship. They are given new Babylonian names, so then when we learned the three men in the fiery furnace, that's why we learned them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or if we watched Veggie Tales, it was Rack, Shack, and Benny rather than their Jewish names. They are taught everything about Babylonian culture, language, and the arts. As a matter of fact, the Babylonians are famous for their achievements in mathematics and astronomy. And their meals come straight from the, Lord's, uh, from the king's table. In other words, this ain't fast food. This is fine dining morning, noon, and night. Nebuchadnezzar wants the best for these young men so that they, in turn, will give him the best years of their service. But here's the problem. Before all that meat and wine is placed on the king's table and then disseminated, disseminated out to his subjects, it is first offered up to the heathen Babylonian god Bel, B-E-L. Now, certainly, that god never existed. So when those Babylonian priests waved it up in the air, they were toss tossing it up to absolutely no one. But the priests thought they were, and everybody else who ate and drank thought they were, everybody except for Daniel and his associates. So should these four young men have taken part in eating that meat and drinking that wine, everybody else would have assumed that they too were okay with Bel as a god, just as much as they worship Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that could not be tolerated. Therefore, our text tells us that Daniel was, quote, resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. The Hebrew text literally says that Daniel laid it on his heart not to defile himself. In other words, he was conscience-bound not to do it. As Martin Luther remarked in his famous Here I Stand speech, to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Recently, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. This isn't, and this isn't the first time one of our branches of government has exercised its right to overturn federal law. Think of the Supreme Court's infamous Dred Scott decision, which upheld slavery only to have it later abolished with the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And there are hundreds of other such instances. Most of these reversals, if not all, have been for the common good, and we as Christian citizens have benefited from them. But what if our government, on the federal, state, or local level, would alter the rule of law in such a way that it would be in direct conflict with God's law, which never changes? If it came down to one or the other, like Daniel, we too must serve God rather than men. And yet, how about in our daily activities, at home or at work or school or at play, when we're confronted with temptation and it seems like we're the only one that sees the dilemma. Do I do this or do, do, do I do this and disobey God or don't I and face possible repercussion from others? At tough times like these, do we seem to take the easy way out and go along with the crowd, trying to pacify our prickling consciences with the thought, well, everybody else seems it's okay with it, so why shouldn't I? Sad to say we often think this way and do just that. And when we do so, God is no longer number one in our lives. We 
have defiled ourselves. But, thank God, our loving Heavenly Father doesn't abandon us to such a sinful state. He cleanses us through His Son, Jesus, who never defiled Himself with royal food and wine, who never defiled Himself, period. On the day of His crucifixion, he was, Jesus was brought before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, who heard his case and declared, I find no basis for the charges against him. Indeed, no one ever had, for Jesus had never sinned. As true God, Jesus could not. But as true man, Jesus could die. He suffered for those times when you went along with the crowd. The God-man died for those times when you allowed yourself to compromise your conscience. Your Lord and your Savior paid for all those times when you put your needs, your wants, your desires ahead of God's. Through the blood of Jesus, the God of Daniel sees you right now as pure, spotless, undefiled. Now, when faced with temptation, with our Lord's help, we can overcome it. We can obey God rather than men. And to that I say thank you for your service to your God. But wait, there's more opportunity for Christian service. Daniel asks his supervisor for permission to eat everything placed before him except the meat and the wine. But he's asking not just for himself, he's also asking for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. David requests in our text, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables. And the word for vegetables is literally things sown, so that would include both greens and grains. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with the others. How we live our lives affects and influences those around us, especially the family of believers. For example, the Apostle Paul deals with a similar situation in 1 Corinthians 8, but in this case, it's getting a good deal at the meat market for some, some nice juicy steaks that are on sale because they have been offered up to the morning sacrifice to one of the Corinthian heathen gods, and you want to get a good deal off of it and take it home and use it for the backyard barbecue that afternoon for your Christian friends and relatives. The apostle advises that if, like you, the, your guests don't see a problem with it because those false gods don't exist, well then, save a few bucks and enjoy a delicious dinner. But Paul also writes that if one of your guests would think that by eating that meat sacrificed to idols, they would be breaking the first commandment, well then, don't do it for your brother or sister's soul's sake. Or how about all the civil demonstrations that occur locally and around the country? It is good to look out for other people's interests when those interests are God-pleasing. It is good to make those in authority aware of the needs of those who cannot help themselves. And we are blessed to have the U.S. Constitution, which allows us to gather together to assemble and also allows our voices to be heard along with others who share our similar concerns. That is serving your neighbor. But when those protests become violent and as a result, uh, and as a result injure others or destroy property, then it becomes self-serving and self-defeating because we're no longer helping our neighbor. Instead, we're hurting them. My brothers and sisters, cherish the good news that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Take to heart the fact that as Lord of all, Jesus deserves to be served, yet he purposely and intentionally served us instead. He purposely and intentionally took all that pain and suffering we intentionally or unintentionally inflicted upon others and took that all upon himself when he paid for our soul's ransom payment in blood, in his blood. Now washed clean in his righteousness, we can graciously and gratefully look out for our brothers' and sisters' needs. And to that I say, thank you for your service. 
to your fellow believers. But wait, there's more. There's still more opportunities for Christian service. The 10-day trial period was completed, and afterwards Daniel and his associates passed the test. So Daniel's request stood. After their three years of instruction were completed, the four of them were presented before the king, and they graduated at the top of their class with positions of great honor and high authority. And then the last verse of our text adds this important note. Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, if my math is correct, that's 66 years that Daniel served in government when, since he first got to Babylon. He served in government for 66 years. That means that as a teenager, Daniel got there, started serving in government, and continued to serve well into his 80s. In fact, the whole Daniel in the lion's den scandal occurs towards the end of his career. Think of that. Somebody in government service of over 60 years who has a spotless track record so that the only thing his enemies have against him is that he serves the one true God. If only that were still true today. And Daniel didn't serve in just one heathen government, but two. The Persian Empire defeated the Babylonians and literally fired everybody in government, everybody except for Daniel. Under the new king, Cyrus, Daniel was still able to serve his God, his fellow believers, and his new government. Was it Daniel who pointed out to the king that his name was specifically mentioned in Isaiah's prophecy some 200 years earlier? Whether or not he did during Daniel's service under the new regime, he witnessed a great many of his fellow exiles return back to the promised land as God had promised. Daniel was able to use his God-given gifts faithfully in government service. God grant that we have more servants like Daniel in our government today. But the point to be made here is not that you have to serve specifically in government. The point is to be faithful with the gifts God has specifically entrusted to you. If you do feel happen, do you, if you do happen to feel qualified to serve in government on the local, state, or national level, great, God bless your efforts. But as prestigious as these positions may be to the public, just as prestigious in God's eyes are the parent who lovingly takes their child out for some ice cream, the teenager who lovingly mows the lawn of their homebound neighbor, the worker who, or the employer who lovingly provides their workers with an honest wage, the retiree who lovingly watches their grandchild while the parent is at work, and the neighbor who lovingly shares a beer and a brat with their friends in the backyard. All these examples of their examples of faithful service, service done out of love, and our motivation for doing so is as John writes in his first epistle, we love because he first loved us. And to that I say, thank you for your service in your vocation. This four-day weekend, we celebrate our national independence. But for the Christian, every day is Independence Day. For in Christ, we are free. Free from sin so that we are free to serve. Thank you for your service. Amen.